we thank you for downloading the podcast. We have a football centric one, but not all pro football. In a little bit, Pete Thamel, who works for Yahoo Sports, he's a good friend. Pete uh, broke the Urban Meyer story, but we're going to talk about something that Pete was talking about in relation to that. And that's college coaches going to the pros. I don't mean Urban Meyer, but the conversation came up, and I wanted to explore it a bit more because the two games, college and pro ball, look more alike than ever. So Pete's going to get into some of that with us in a little bit. But first, Kurt Warner. You know his credentials? Hall of Famer, Super Bowl champ, the rags to riches story from bagging groceries to holding the, the Lombardi trophy. Uh, Kurt and I are going to do a couple of Saturday night games in the booth on NFL Network the next two weeks. Chargers, Ravens, a week from Saturday, this Saturday. Broncos and Browns, we get to see Baker Mayfield in person for the first time. Looking forward to that. So a conversation with uh, Kurt, not just about the TV business, but what he sees around the league as we get down to the money time in the NFL. Here's the Hall of Famer. All right, Warner, you're back stuck with me. I apologize in advance for the next two Saturday nights. Oh, shoot. Uh, you get to carry me, so it's always nice. I only get to do a couple of these a year, and to have you as a pro and kind of lead the way, it's, uh, it makes it easy for me, my man. That's fun. You're kind of stuck with me. Ever since your Super Bowl, I have uh, sitting in my office at home, and I've got the picture up there of, uh, of your, uh, your Super Bowl. It's amazing, Kurt, how, how long ago it really was. And uh, think, about, <laughs> think about the journey and so many steps. And uh, you've been on TV for so long now, the Gold Jacket, the Hall of Fame. I see you putting the lone wolf hat on on Sunday mornings, <laughs> making picks. It's, Try to avoid it, that. What, 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 what are the, it's, it is one of the best football journeys. But, but it, it, you still get a joy out of the game. Every time I listen to you and watch you, I still feel like you're a fan of not just the game, but the people who play the game. Well, and that's to me is is the best part. I mean, I, I love the studio stuff and the show that we do. Like you said, putting the lone wolf hat on and kind of being, uh, you know, dorky sometimes, <laughs> and you know, having fun around the game. But there's nothing that I enjoy more than going to the stadium. You know, it's why I do the radio that I do with Westwood One, mm-hmm. and why I love doing these games. Uh, with you every year is that being at the stadium and being around the guys and cheering for these players. I mean, you know, like this game that we have this week, I mean, how great is it? How many rookies are we going to talk about uh, on those three hours on Saturday night? Is that, you know, so many young guys that are just starting to write their story. And um, as you said, my, my story is kind of crazy, but I cheer for those guys that do it a little bit differently. Not that I don't cheer for the guys that get drafted number one overall, but I love the guys that do it differently and have a different story and journey. And to be able to cover that and get to know these guys, to me, is the best part of the game. As much as I love and am passionate about the X's and O's, it's the stories. It's the people. It's what this game does to, uh, to give you know, families like mine and individuals like me opportunities to, to chase their dreams and do things they never thought imaginable. Let me let me ask you about one of the stories of the year, and it's uh, one of the players who, as a rookie, we didn't see much of last year, but Patrick Mahomes has just grabbed the league. And uh, just, Kurt, from your perspective, the overlay of his talent with Andy Reid, Andy Reid's not just knowledge of offense in the NFL, but his creativity later in his career to expand what he knows offensively to find the skill set with Mahomes that's uh, been just a joy to watch this year. Well, I tell you what. I mean, it, it is. It's it's kind of threefold. It is that you start with Andy Reid, and he does a great job of creating some easy opportunities for the quarterback. You know, there's a lot of teams in the league that don't do a very good job of that uh, for young quarterbacks. Is creating those easy opportunities. He does a wonderful job of that. So you know, you'll see at times, especially early on, you know, these guys running wide open, and Patrick just has to kind of drop back and throw it to him because Andy's created. Um, you know, something great. And then you have the part of Patrick Mahomes that's like you just threw him a ball in his backyard and it's like, dude, you got to get a touchdown. Just go, go find a way to, to get a touchdown. And he runs around and he does these crazy things. I mean, you know, Sunday was maybe the greatest example of some of those, you know, no-look passes and, you know, 40 yards throwing, to, you know, running to his right and fourth and nine. I mean, all those crazy things is like, him just playing backyard football, and, you know, as weird as it sounds, not everybody can do that. Not everybody can just take a ball and just do whatever you have to do to make it work, right. and Patrick has that. And then there's a combination, or then there's the, the, that middle ground of playing the quarterback position. And this kid is not just benefiting from a great offense, and he's not just benefiting because he's uniquely talented. 
he's a really good quarterback, and he sees things, and he understands how to play the game and how things are being done. And so you put those three things together, and even though I don't think Patrick Mahomes is where he's going to be three or four years from now, but you put those three things together, and you've got a magical season for a second-year guy that, uh, you know, I don't even think probably Patrick Mahomes and Andy Reid expected yeah. it to play out like it has, but it's all come together. Uh, it's so much fun to watch, and I can't wait to see where it goes. How special can this kid be as he continues to grow when you couple uh, those other, th- other two things with it? It is pretty cool. Uh, the, the combo together is just the right combo. Now, there, there's a lot of good stories in the league, and, and I want to talk about this one part of football that intrigues me because – I, I can see your pattern. Tuesdays, you get back from your Monday night game, and you're watching some tape from around the league. Because invariably, around lunchtime, mid-afternoon, you get a Kurt Warner uh, tweet about some of the things that frustrate him. And there's usually <laughs> there's usually a theme to it, Kurt. Like I, I remember you guys with the Rams, and there were really intricate and developed route combinations. I, I feel like a lot of football now is reverting to a little bit of what we see, especially in the college game of... Uh, athlete, just go jump ball, go make a play. Yeah. And some of the nuance in the pass game is being lost with the volume of pass game. Is that a fair statement to say generally about what's happening with football right now? Yeah, I think it is a fair statement. And, and I think the thing that frustrates me the most, you know, I sat down with uh, uh, with Philip Rivers a couple weeks ago, mm-hmm. yeah. you know, and just asked him about how guys like him and, and Breeze and Brady are having such great success later in their career when, you know, a decade ago, everybody thought when you got to that age, it's time to retire. You just need to get out. And, you know, I asked him why, and he goes, because he said he he believes that still at the end of the day, you got to be able to drop back seven steps, read a defense, and make that throw. You know, whatever that throw is, you got to be able to make that throw, that difference-making throw. And so you can have all these talented young guys that can run around and make plays. But it's not sustainable week in and week out, especially when you play against great teams. It's why you haven't seen, you know, really any of those kind of quarterbacks, you know, the, you know, kind of run around and just create, not able to, you know, to make all the plays in the pocket. You just don't see those guys succeed year in and year out or or compete for championships on a consistent basis. Because ultimately at the end of the day, this is what you have to do. You have to see it. You have to understand it. You have to be able to make the plays that you're supposed to make, not just those special plays that you hope to make every time out. And it frustrates me because I don't know if it's lack of coaching. Um, you know, I don't know, you know where the concepts come from sometimes. If it's simply just, hey, my guy can't handle that yet. He's, we got to go more of the college football approach. Right. But I'm a firm believer, Mike, that the game's not as complicated as we make it sometimes. Like, for me... A good football concept, if I'm playing against a zone defense, is I'm going to get two guys on one guy, or I'm going to get three guys on two guys, and I'm always going to have an advantage when I see a zone defense. I mean, whether you play basketball back in eighth grade or or, you know football at the in the NFL, that to me is how simple it can be. So now the quarterback has to understand, okay, what coverage am I seeing, and in that coverage, where's my read and who am I reading? And if you can do that, the game just becomes so much easier. But I see it such a struggle for a lot of these young guys because they either don't have the understanding of that or the concepts don't, um, don't apply that way. So they're running around and just surviving, and they're not going to be able to survive that way for very long unless right. they're ultra-talented and they're just a unique being. And so it frustrates me when I watch film that I want to just – reach out to all of them and say, come to my house and let's sit down and let's watch film and let's talk through what football is all about and how we can make it easier for you. Because on the flip side, I watched Drew Brees. And I don't think anybody's better in the league at going, okay, here's my matchup. Let me see that guy. Oh, he does this. I'm going to throw it there and get the ball out of my hands and make plays. And he just plays the position so efficiently that I just enjoy watching it. And I'm, I'm afraid – we don't have a lot of young guys that are being taught or have that understanding or are going down that path where, you know, four, five, six years from now, even though we got some talented guys, 
will be able to sustain it the way a Drew Brees or Phillip Rivers or Tom Brady has. It's a good point because a lot of those guys, Kurt, are going to college and it's, okay, we're at the line, no huddle, and now we're going to look over the sideline. They're going to tell us where to go with yep. the ball. And you can't blame the college guys. Or your son's in college football. He's at Nebraska. You know, these coaches are trying to win games, so they're they're maximizing. My eyes up in the box the for me are going to see what's going on a lot better than these guys, yep. but they're not getting the experience yep. doing that. And it's funny, you mentioned it. You, you did the uh, Seattle game on radio on uh, Monday night, and Russell Wilson was a quarterback who played a lot of college football, came in with a little bit of that, but ran around for a while. Now he's starting mm-hmm. to see some of that stuff, and you're, you're starting to see that middle of the career progress to a quarterback who can be in the pocket, read it, see it, which really maximizes his legs. Think about the big run he had uh, in the fourth quarter uh, on Monday night, that run down the sideline where he kept yep. going and going. He's using that physical ability and his ability to read the field better to his advantage right now. Maybe it's why he's playing in the best yep. football he's ever played. Yeah, well, and, and the thing is is that now he's only got to – I mean, you watch that game. He only had to make one of those plays. Right, right, right. They won with him making one play. Right. And so when you can make the plays you're supposed to make in the pocket, the easy ones, the easy reads, get it out, let the other guys do the work, and then they say, hey, if you can give us two of those a game, we can win. Russell Wilson's going to be able to do that for a long time. <laughs> exactly. You know, if you're going to say, hey, be that guy you were as a rookie where you are going to run around the whole entire game and you've got to make 15 or 20 of those plays for us to win and be successful – now, as you get older, you're going to struggle. You're not going to be able to survive because ultimately the physical things are going to go, and you're not going to be able to live in that world anymore. And so I agree with you completely is that I understand it when you're your early, your young years, and it's kind of like, hey, we're going to throw you out there, and you've got to survive a little bit. But at some point, I want to see that growth. So, yeah, as you get three or four years into this, man, I can make every throw I need to make in the pocket, and then if it does break down one or two times, I'll make those special plays, and that's how you will win championships and compete consistently. And so that's what I'm hoping, but I'm just not seeing a lot of that development or uh, a lot of schemes that really help that development uh, with some of these young guys. All right, lastly, and we could it's a good thing we're going to hang out for a couple of days the next few <laughs> weeks, and we've got three hours on TV because I love talking football. I'm just going to hear you just give me quick, Quick uh, one-sentence answers here. Uh, the offense of the Rams, can it sustain all the way through in the playoffs? We saw them get slowed down by Chicago last week. If they can protect Jared Goff. That's mm-hmm. been the key all year long. Yeah. They didn't protect him very well against Chicago, and you saw what happened. So if they can protect him as they have most of the year and stay healthy up front, I do think you know they're not going to have to travel to Chicago, and, and I think they'll be fine in the playoffs. Do you think teams have come up with the answer for New Orleans not having that other game-breaking receiver to take the attention off Thomas and they cover the rest of those receivers pretty much man-to-man? Uh, I don't think they have. Uh, mm-hmm. Because once again, you know, this is a team that's balanced. That you can't just go man across the board every time because Sean Payton can scheme you that way. And, you know, and they've got the ability to run the football with two guys. Uh, and then Kamara is always a matchup nightmare. You know, if you can take away Thomas, great. How are you going to take away Kamara with all the things that they do with him? So I don't think people have figured it out yet. But once again, Dallas, how did they slow him down? They got to breeze consistently with four guys. And it doesn't matter how good you are, Mike. If you get to a quarterback and you pressure him and you make him think faster than he wants to, nobody's nearly as good. And you hit on my last two, Dallas and Houston. Do those teams have enough to take them to where they can play in the championship game, the AFC and NFC championship game, respectively? I think everything is going to have to go right for both of them. Um, I think they have a lot of pieces. I think they're good in certain areas. Um, But I look at those two quarterbacks specifically, Mike, and I say, can those two guys do what we were talking about? Can they make the throws they're supposed to make consistently? You know, Deshaun Watson, unbelievable last year. But he's still learning his way on how to play inside the pocket. And he's trying to survive with making a lot of those extra plays. And if you've watched them this year, that's the one area they've struggled. They averaged 30-some points a game when he played last year. This year, they've only been over 24, I think, four times all year long, even though they've won, you know, they, they've won nine in a row. So a lot of it, to me, is going to fall on those quarterbacks against good teams when they have to make those plays they're supposed to make. Can they do that consistently? 
He's the best. He's in the Hall of Fame for a reason. Uh, Super Bowl winning quarterback. Kurt, look forward to seeing you next couple of weeks, man, and talking football. It's uh, great to catch up. Very lucky to uh, couch as one of the one of the friends I've made along the way here uh, covering the NFL and looking forward to some time together. Well, I feel the same way, and I can't wait. Um, I'm getting ready to get started right now, so I'll see you soon. Our thanks to Kurt. Let's pivot to college ball here a little bit, but keep talking NFL, too. And the conversation of the game, that we had this a little bit with Kurt, looking more like college football than ever before. Think about college football, the wishbone, and the option. You never saw those concepts come to the NFL. But this spread stuff, which started in the NFL back in the 80s to take a little bit of a foothold, has now circled back where the spread game on Saturdays looks like the spread game in part that you see on Thursday, Sunday, and Monday in the NFL. Let's uh, talk to one of the best observers of college football, Pete Thamel, about that. All right, let's talk some uh, college sports here now. Uh, there have been a couple of things, and also the intersection of where college ball and pro ball is going in football. And In terms of coaching, I want to bring in uh, Pete Thamel, who is – with Yahoo Sports, he is their uh, number one guy for college sports, both football and basketball. He's done some tremendous reporting over the last year or so, which is what you come to expect from an alum of the greatest communication school on planet Earth, Syracuse. Peter, how are you? <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. I would have bet the under on time it took for Syracuse to be mentioned on this podcast. So hey, well, well, hey, funny there, you know. There, there, <laughs> there's there's no, there's nothing to hide here, man. Look, if if you want <laughs> if you want to be in journalism or communications, go to Syracuse. Everything else, we wish you well. But you go to Syracuse, you're going to yeah. be you'll be competing with the best. It's like it's like signing up to play Alabama twelve straight weeks. You're going to compete with the best every single game, right? <laughs> Absolutely. No, Syracuse uh, was wonderful four years for me. Uh, buy, a, buy a North Face, get a scarf, and, uh, you know, go go battle it out. No, it's hey. good. Uh, did you watch the uh, the Georgetown game on Saturday, Mike? Were you on the I, I did. Actually, the funny the story. You were watching it. <laughs> no, you know, what's funny. I was in the air. I, I uh, had a flight that did not have um, uh, live TV. Which you know in the in twenty in twenty eighteen you say oh man what a tough break and five years ago you would have been like what what are you talking about how can you complain about that uh, yeah. so I was watching on my phone and the last thing I saw was Tyus Battle shot to put Syracuse up one with a couple of seconds left and had to wait till we got Wi Fi at ten thousand feet to find out if Georgetown <laughs> won or not but I got to see the thirty nine minutes and fifty eight seconds of uh, of the glory of defeating. The uh, the Hoyas. So hey, uh, I, this all started for me, at least in my mind, of connecting with you after the Urban Meyer deal went down. You were on Dan Patrick's show. I enjoy listening to Dan's show, and you made a point that I've talked about a lot, and that's college football's coaching, coaching style, all those Big Twelve fifty two to forty eight games, blending more into the NFL. Although not exclusively, we've seen defensive games of late. But how that opens eyes to the college coaching guys moving on to the NFL. Uh, I'm curious what you're hearing from the college world about more coaches thinking about going to the NFL than a few years ago. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a fascinating topic, Mike. And uh, I guess to start your with to answer your micro question, uh, I did a story on Yahoo last week that identified the top ten college guys who could move up and. Mm-hmm. The, the sense I got in talking to NFL folks for that story was that, look, these worlds have never been closer schematically, you know, maybe in the last generation, right? I guess 25 years ago, everything kind of looked the same, um, you know, more more or less at both levels. The NFL trickled down to college. In the last 10, 15 years, there's been a significant trickle up. So could it be Lincoln Riley? Obviously, his schemes have been unbelievable, back-to-back Heisman winners and uh Playoff bids, and he's certainly the, uh, the the boy genius of the uh, of, of the whole collegiate scene right now. And the success right. of Baker Mayfield, obviously in the NFL, has only uh, accentuated that. Matt Campbell at Iowa State is obviously uh, is obviously another name that comes up. And then there's some older guard names too that have uh, that have sort of I, I think of more schematically as blended, like Chris Peterson at Washington. I think Brian Kelly's name will come up in this cycle again if he's ever gonna if he's ever gonna leave Notre Dame. If this would certainly be a, a pretty pretty strong window for him to uh, for him to exit on. So, and then obviously David Shaw is is the first one on that list. I mean, he's always long been the most coveted guy in that world, but he's very much a uh, he's very much a pure uh, old guard pro style guy. But I feel like one thing that gets lost in this schematic collision 
mm-hmm. is actually that the Patriots really like 10 years ago were among the uh, were among the first to, to really dial in. They went down when Urban Meyer was at Florida. Josh McDaniels got very close to Dan Mullen, who was offensive coordinator then and is head coach at Florida now. And uh, Urban Meyer and Bill Belichick spent a lot of time together. And some of those great Patriots teams of the, you know, the 07, 08, 09 era ran a lot of two-back stuff that was, and again, it wasn't spread like you saw it in college, but there were a lot of conceptual things borrowed that were brought up then. And they just weren't in, in you know, there were quick counts and some different things. Chip Kelly and Bill Belichick are, are very close. And, uh, you know, when Bill O'Brien was there, especially there, there was a lot of interchange between the chips Oregon program and there. And right. so I think that's one of the things that, that funneled it in. And then when you, when you, when you look back, then the, the trickle up obviously happened with Chip Kelly. I mean, the Eagles ran a lot of spread stuff in the Super Bowl last year. The big joke about the Super Bowl was that it looked like a, uh, looked like a Big 12 game, right? Exactly. And so exactly. I, I just think the scores are starting to match, you know, what the, what the schemes have done. And, and uh, I, I do think that it's a fascinating strategic sociological study. Yeah. And, and Pete, I, I think it's twofold. I'm going to take it out of the coaching realm for a second. I think one part of it is the way the rules have come with uh, you cannot hit hard across the middle of the field, that intimidating safety, think of Ronnie ha- mm-hmm. uh, Rodney Harrison, think of John Lynch, think, think of guys who just uh, hit you over the middle, Sean Taylor. Think th- that play player and that play coming out of the game has opened the middle of the field to passes that players wouldn't throw from the quarterback position eight, ten years ago. Uh, and mm-hmm. secondly... Secondly, the quarterbacks, now with all the RPOs and all, all that other stuff, the quarterbacks who run are finding a lane in the NFL. And the old idea was, look, hey, look, you're a running quarterback, great. Come on into the NFL, and after a few years, you'll be a pocket passer because you can't mm-hmm. survive. Your body cannot physically take the toll of running mm-hmm. the way you did in college. That, that's why the option never became an NFL option. The defenders are too fast mm-hmm. and too big, and they would inflict damage on that most uh, valued commodity of a football team, a really good starting quarterback. Mm-hmm. But, but I think we've seen, and Russell Wilson might be right there within an Aaron Rodgers a little bit before that, using the sliding rules, knowing how to run, knowing how to get down and not take those hits, that's allowing those running quarterbacks to have that continued lane in their game, and that opens up some more passing stuff, and that plus some of the spread stuff, I think, might be why we're seeing that transition to more of the co- the pro game looking like the college game than we've ever seen before. Yeah. Let's not underestimate the high school game's impact on this, yes. too, Mike, yeah. because this is a great story. So Nick Mullins at the 49ers has been one of the feel-good stories of the year in, in the NFL. He obviously was undrafted out of Southern Miss where he'd started for four years. And uh, his quarterback coach told me at a camp two summers ago when they picked him up as a free agent, uh, Rich Gangarillo, and he really liked Mullins. He said he'd never taken a snap under center before he started playing in the All-Star games, right. which isn't all that uncommon. So he actually taught himself on YouTube. So before he went to the, I believe it was the East West Shrine game. He wasn't even in like the Senior Bowl. It mm-hmm. was it was one of the B, one of the B list games. He went on YouTube and taught himself how to <laughs> take a snap. And then there's some pretty intricate footwork in how you fall back from taking the snap. And yes. I tell that anecdote to underscore the bigger notion that I remember when Charlie Strong got the Texas job. He told me that 90 percent of the schools in Texas run the spread. Right, so those are, right. you know, there's just a generation of kids who aren't playing what we consider traditional kind of pro style football. And instead of literally having to teach them the most basic things, the NFL is adapting to what they know. Right. You know, Parcells would say, we had, and I've said this a few times on the podcast, so I apologize for the repeaters, but Parcells would always say, uh, in, t- in terms of players, you know, we can't grow what they're not making. So at the college yeah. level, if, if they're not making fullbacks, we, we can't run fullback offense. At some point, you've got to take the natural resource that has been honed, developed, and grown and mm-hmm. take that skill set to the NFL game. And I, I'll even go a step farther with you. And I, The high school ball is one thing, but the seven-on-seven stuff that For happens sure. around it, too. Uh, I, I yeah. was at my son played a, a pretty good level of competitive soccer, and we're at one of these soccer mm-hmm. tournaments, a regional tournament, and three fields on this other side of this complex were taken up by seven-on-seven teams. Here's a seven-on-seven team from Canada coming to play a seven-on-seven team from Texas, playing a team from Ohio, and that circuit just gets the guys to throw, throw routes, throw timing routes, 
5,000 more times in a summer than they would just in their football practice. And that's where we've seen the high-end development of those games, which is why, Pete, now that the college game can do it, and you'll see freshmen or sophomores come in and be at a pretty high level doing the uh, offensive stuff that used to take years to learn at the college level. Yeah, seven-on-seven has become equitable to AAU, both in good in terms of exposure and development. I think the AAU sometimes gets derided a little bit because of the negative connotations that have that have come along with federal investigations and such that have, uh, that have followed. But there's positive, right? Kids are playing. They're playing against the best, and they're really learning how to perform you know, certain nuances of the game at extremely high levels. And I think that's, I think that's really, uh, I think that's really been an important part of seven on seven. But I mean, there's now kids, Mike, who are getting college scholarship offers off their seven on seven film. I mean, it's an important part of, important part of a game where, Absolutely. you know, some coaches say to me, like, you know, you, you still have to like block and tackle, you know, uh, right. cause the seven on seven is essentially, you know, it's essentially flag football and, uh, and that. But I do think, you know, look, I think this offensive renaissance has been great for the sport, right? Yes. Like, you know, that, that game, that's not, I, I, that's not what we're conditioned to watch. Um, you know, when you think about the, the Seahawks Vikings on Monday night, like that's, we're conditioned for, for more excitement. And, and I just think it's generally been good for fans and players, uh, except for defense players, uh, tend to, tend to want to play in games like that. And obviously, I think the ratings have reflected it too. I mean, last year at this time, there was just this gloom over the NFL because of the kneeling and because of Trump and, and everything like that. And this season certainly hasn't lacked its ills with what happened with Kareem Hunt. But I do just generally think the people are going to watch the games if they're yes. exciting, and the, that the, is, is is equated to high scoring. I, I agree with you. The, the product is better on the field. It's It's been a more exciting game. And when you do get the defensive matchup of, let's say, the Bears against this high-powered Rams offense, it almost adds to the level of intrigue, even though the score is not at Chiefs-Rams level. Uh, it adds to that palace intrigue of, okay, here comes the offense against this big, bad defense. And, you know, th- yeah. that whole uh, that whole story that we've seen played out throughout in sports, that great defense against the great offense, which one uh, survives. Mm-hmm. I, I want to ask you about just a philosophical of the coaching position, because now with the media-infused incredible money that's in intercollegiate athletics, which is a whole mm-hmm. separate conversation, yeah. they pay college football coaches as well as NFL coaches get paid for the most part mm-hmm. um, at, at, the, at the elite levels. Would you say that a college football head coaching job might be just as good to have uh, in more than five or six spots than an NFL job? And let's let's just take you know Notre Dame, Bama, uh, the USC's, Texas, yeah. the legendary schools, and the Clemson is added there with their run here and all that stuff. We know there's ten or twelve schools Notre Dame that you go, okay, those are special career mm-hmm. type. We build a statue for you if you win type places. Mm-hmm. But now in general, when these other schools can pay three, four million dollars and you're living on a college campus or in a college town, perhaps because of the longevity that recruiting requires, that may be just as good as going to grab, you know, the Cincinnati job or the Cleveland job in the NFL. What where do you sit on that conversation? No, it, it, it's a great question, and I remember coming up in the business uh back when I was working at the New York Times having conversations with agents who have both clients in the NFL and college football, and they would tell you there's 15 to 20 jobs in college football that are better than some of the the lower end NFL jobs, you know, like just mm-hmm. in some of the periphery markets or like the, the ones who have wacky owners, you know, <laughs> like ultimately like the, the, the ownership sets the tone. And if there's instability there and we've seen it over and over and, you know, the franchises that end up toiling, it usually starts with ownership and, and goes down. And that creates, like, lack of stability. Look at how many coaches the Browns have churned through, you know, in the last uh, in the last seven or eight years. I mean, it's it's preposterous, quite frankly. Um, you know, they're, they're just one and done in guys and in, in, in doing that. And that, I think you can equate some of that to just unstable uh, and unsophisticated ownership. So, um, no, I, I agree with that, uh, with that assessment completely, that there are – when you look at the Texases, the Oklahomas, Florida, Alabama, uh, USC would certainly be in that uh, in that conversation. Notre Dame, obviously, Michigan would be one. Ohio State, Penn State, like those are better than at least a dozen NFL jobs, in my opinion, Mike. Mm-hmm. And uh, 
it's just the way everything's gone. I mean, think about this, just where, you know, if, if this is a, a heavy NFL listenership and they don't have a, a good gauge of college coaching salaries, the LSU defensive coordinator right. makes more money than the gentleman, uh, Chris Kleiman, who just got hired as the head coach at Kansas State in the Big 12. Right, right exactly. <laughs> $2.5 million to $2.3 million for Dave Aran at LSU. So, I mean, there's uh, – you know, there's it's a, it's an unbelievable and look, he's probably worth it, right? Like, oh, yeah. You know, if you if you, if you if you drill down, and he's obviously the, the top of his field and the top of any you know top of his field in a billion dollar industry, and it's not the you know it's a subfield, but there's there's a market for it. You know, they weren't bidding against themselves. Uh, Florida State was, uh, oh, no, I'm sorry, Texas A and M was very interested in in the uh, at the end of the last cycle, and if you're Unless you don't want to lose, you don't want to lose, you know, one of your key assets to one of your key division rivals. Right, so, and Texas A and M uh, hired Notre Dame's defensive coordinator just yes. to, just to give you a sense of you know you'd never leave yeah. Notre Dame for a parallel job, but that's what's happened with the infusion and the money in the SEC and the growth there, and, that, and that's how that sport has changed. So let me let me get get to the end end point here uh, on this. The timing, Pete, mm-hmm. because the college the, the college hiring cycle has really two two lanes that that last week of the regular season slash conference championships and now if your team is not in one of the four big uh, big slots in the playoff or one of the big bowls maybe some movement starts to happen certainly the teams that are firing a coach or have let somebody go are actively out there trying to grab their guy and often when you're jumping up uh, from a one level job to the next level job you can make some moves there and then at the end of the bowl season, there's usually a, a cycle of a big job moves somewhere. How, how hard is it for a college guy to really get a look at the NFL, considering the timing of recruiting, signing bowl games, and everything else in college football? Well, if you're, if you're a college guy, I think it's actually harder for NFL guys to return to college hmm. than it is for college guys to go to the NFL, Mike. And here's why. Like, if you are, you know, the Kansas State just filled on uh, on Monday night, and that right. was the, the final one in this of uh, Power Five jobs so far in this cycle. I call it the first wave of this cycle. Right. So if you were Kansas State and you wanted to hire, uh, you know, Josh McDaniels, right? Sure. Well, you're gonna have to wait until mid January, and yes. that's you might miss two signing days: the the December one, and then you probably wouldn't miss the February one unless they made the Super Bowl. But, but but that February one is you're you're gonna get a pretty much an empty class at that point. You'll just be picking up yes. best available scraps. Yes, and you know there's there's ways to do it. Do you remember Charlie Weiss at the Super Bowl one year yep. had a uh, had had a Notre Dame uh, signing day press conference? Yes, yes, he did. He absolutely did. <laughs> God bless Charlie. Uh, but that's you know there's there's an inherent awkwardness to that and. Whereas the college cycle, certainly it's not pleasant to sign 20 kids and then walk out the door on them, which essentially you would have to do. Um, right, right. But that it, that happens and has happened and will happen, and it's a, you know, it's a business and everybody understands it. And at least now the kids who aren't on campus can, can you know, renege on their commitment cleanly and, and, and go elsewhere if they, uh, if they had wanted, you know, exclusively to go to that school for that coach. But exactly. I, I do always feel, because you always start hearing these names, you know, these NFL names in, involved in these searches, and it's just like, oh, man, that is, a, that is an awkward tightrope to walk on to get that guy. If you, you know, you might have to wait six weeks. Exactly. And Alabama, and Nick Saban's kind of found the balance for when a coordinator gets hired for a head coach, almost it's like go right back to that file. Hey, we're going to give you a separate office to go down the hall and make your calls for school X. But but when you start yeah. talking about the NFL and college and the, the way the calendars don't exactly sync, that, that's a fascinating part. Is there an element, Pete, of college football that you would like to see more of in the NFL or vice versa? Is there an element on or off the field from the NFL that you would like to see come down to the college game? That's a that's a really good question, and I'll be full disclosure. I watch the NFL. I don't want to sit here and think, I don't watch the NFL, but right. I don't watch a ton of it. This time of year, I start to watch a lot more. It's certainly now with our phones and our computers, we see highlights of uh, we see highlights of, of, of everything. Um, you know, I, I just think about like the you know sitting in Jeff Brom's office earlier this year, and it, it, the, the world is so flat now, right? I mean, it's mm-hmm. even cliche to call the world flat, but like Jeff Brom was saying, how like just ask an NBA team. player. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, it's flat. There's just uh, yeah, there's uh, there's just no one on the moon, right? Right, exactly. Um, or no one's ever landed on the moon. <laughs> that, that too. Uh, you know, Jeff Brown was like, I, you know, I watched the Chiefs on Sunday, and he he sees that little shovel they've run to uh, to Tyree Kill, and you know he's installing it for Rondell Moore on Monday. Yeah, you know? that's cool. Like, it's that's just, cool. I, I really like have an appreciation for the for the synergy that's uh, that's gone on. You know what I'd like to see? I'd like to see Mike Leach coordinate in the NFL at some that, juncture. That I would be pretty that interesting to see if he I could do that. Just <laughs> yeah, th- there would be so much cool about that. Um, it would be just be a really interesting interesting experiment. I mean, look what he did with Gardner Minshew. Gardner Minshew was a bad quarterback at East Carolina, and he had fifth in the Heisman. Right. Like, right. And, and they have good players at Washington State, but they didn't have they don't have USC skill. Um, no. So I think that that kind of thing just to you know, and again the air raids happened in the NFL. It started there. You know, you go Mouse Davis and June Jones and all that stuff. But I think it would be fun to see that in this NFL be given a chance. I'm glad you pointed that out because the run and shoot and all that stuff came in in the NFL, and then they finally figured out the hits that the receivers were taking of the quarterbacks. It was too much cycled out, but kind of comes back in college in, di- in different places and different ways, and then mainstreams itself, and now the, the two sides of the road connect again. The one thing I'd like to see, I'd like to see actually college adapt more of the NFL's timing rules because of the incredible amount of passing in college ball they've adjusted the timing rules a little bit but i think the mm-hmm. next adjustment of it like we don't need to stop the clock after a first down until we get to the end of the game uh the concept oh, so you're killing me because i love that it, it, it makes college games so much more exciting at the end but oh no 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 you, you didn't let me finish until the last five minutes oh my fault yeah, no, no, no. That, that, yeah. that, that, that's okay because, like, you know, some people don't realize the the two minute warning. Yes, it's there for a commercial too, but the two minute yeah. warning is really there to change the timing rules and the fumbling rules. So the two minute warning, there are rules changes and procedures that change within the game. That's really why there's a two minute warning, and you could do that in college at four or five minutes and still keep that end of game excitement because of the clock mm-hmm. there. But by the same token, then you'll cut down on the four-hour window it takes to play a Big 12 game. So th- th- those are th- that's one thing I think one game can learn from the other and uh, continue to do the growth. I-, I do know that I've talked to some folks on the NFL Competition Committee. They're doing more mm-hmm. work with the college game so that oh. maybe it won't be one set of rules per se, but a more uniform approach to rules, especially the tackling rules, because I think the NFL realizes that the safety rules, the hitting, the targeting, the helmet hits, if that can continue to trickle Mm -hmm. down and get one set of language that's used at every level of football, that they they can work together better and uh, and, and help keep the game as safe as possible and keep the game going for a little bit longer, to be honest. Yeah. Amen to that. Targeting has been the biggest mess officiating wise. It, it feels like it's real different every conference. I've just talked to a lot of officiating people. Um, Terry McCauley, who you probably mm-hmm. have gotten to know uh, this year, who I think is one of the, one of the best at that stuff. Like, yeah, there needs, there needs to be uniformity there. We need the game to be safer. There's no doubt about that. And we also need it, uh, we, we need it ruled more consistently. And right. uh, the Pac-12 has been obviously a glaring example of that this year, but the Big 12 hasn't been great either. So, no, I agree with that, Mike. That's a, that's a great point. I'd love to see some uniformity there. No, it would be fun. Well, uh, as the basketball season goes on, uh, just the on-court, but also the off-court stuff, the the linger of the investigations, the Adidas stuff, all all that stuff. If, if you don't follow my Syracuse guy here, then you're just you're just not finding out stuff uh, when you should. Plain, plain and simple. Pete's not only a great follow on Twitter, but anytime he writes anything, uh, he is as as good as it gets and a great perspective, too, on where college and pro ball are as they kind of sync up. Hey, enjoy the uh, enjoy the playoff and all that good stuff, and I look forward to catch up with you later on during hoop season. Thanks again, Pete. Hey, thank you for thinking of me, Mike. Appreciate it. Some good perspective there from Pete. Our thanks to him and our thanks to Kurt Warner and our thanks to Alex Hardy who put the podcast together. I know we're getting towards the holiday season, so as you are out and about and traveling around, Thanks for downloading us. We'll be with you during the holidays as well. We're going to keep working. Bill Belichick says no days off, right? So we'll uh, keep cranking out the podcasts here over the holidays. Look forward to some of the big action that is ahead. Till next time, we'll see you. Take care. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.